and welcome everyone. Good morning to you who are gathered here in the sanctuary on Rugby Road and to all of you who are joining us online. As we come together, let's all listen now to the music offered us from our own director of music, Scott DeVoe. Scott, that was great, as always. Greetings, everyone, on this beautiful Earth Day Sunday morning. Welcome to our community worship with the UU Congregation of Charlottesville. I am Greg Townsend, serving as your worship weaver today, and I want to apologize in advance for when my explosive sneezing starts. Some of us are in the sanctuaries of our homes, joining in this community online. Welcome. Some of us are in the sanctuary on Rugby Road. This place was built for this congregation over 70 years ago on a hilltop setting on land that is the homeland of the Monacan people and land that was once cared for by enslaved people from Africa. We honor all those who dwelt here before and all those in our congregation over the decades whose lives led to this moment of our gathering once again as a community of memory and hope. We are blessed by their memory. I invite you now to take a moment to greet others who are with you in worship this morning. Those of you on Zoom can unmute and say hello to one another, and those of you here in the building, you can rise and turn to greet those close to you. Many thanks to all the folks helping us share worship both here and online, our on-site greeters, ushers, and hospitality and logistics team. And special thanks to our AV tech team, Sean Scally, Laura Horn, supporting the dual platform worship both online and in the Rugby Road Sanctuary. Today, I am happy as always to be joined in sharing this worship with Scott DeVoe and Reverend Linda. Our sermon today has been offered by three leaders from our congregation, Sharon Biacco, Jean Amaker Sibiak, and Angela Orbaugh. And here to offer greetings from your board of trustees, is President Pam McIntyre. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to UUCville. I'm Pam McIntyre, and I'm the president of the board for this year and for next. This is a very exciting time at UUCville with our upcoming annual congregation meeting in June and making so many plans for the upcoming year. Reverend Linda has been amazing for us in so many, many ways. I especially appreciate how she's helped us look deeply at all aspects of our church and our community functioning. So now we are ready to begin work with our developmental minister, Reverend Tim Temerson in August. My heart hurts at the thought of Reverend Linda completing her time with us but I'm very grateful that we've had her with us. I greatly appreciate having our congregation as a sanctuary of love and kindness in these difficult times, and I look forward to more times to be together. I'll be outside, in the, outside the social hall after the service if anyone has any questions or concerns or wants to talk things over. And for those of you online, you can always email me at president at uucharlottesville.org. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> A reminder for everyone in the sanctuary to keep everyone as safe as possible. We ask you to keep your high quality mask in place as I see everyone is doing. Thank you. We welcome donations from those of you who decide to use the masks which we provide. Seating is also in the social hall this morning where you can participate in worship by watching a live stream video on a large screen. The social hall is particularly welcoming to families with young children with a play space including blocks and toys. Supervised play is also available on the, back, on the playground during worship. We hope you will do what you need to do this morning 
feel comfortable, as we all do our best, to care for one another and keep each other as healthy and safe as possible. Now, let us bring our hearts and minds into worship with these words from the Reverend Gretchen Haley. Open the door of your hesitant heart. Let the light shine on all the sleeping shadows. Awaken to this day that offers itself to you. And to all with a great extravagance, awaken to this gift, this beauty, this chance. Let us surprise this earth with a new song, sung together, calling us all in, and then sending us back out, and know it all as a blessing. Come, let us worship together. Hallelujah. I must thank Scott DeVoe and our virtual UU Seville Choir for having recorded that back in those dark COVID days when that was the only way we had a choir. And so thank you to all of you who helped make that possible for us to hear your beautiful voices. I'd like to invite Dave Schutt to come forward now to light our chalice this morning. Thank you, Dave. So we've got it right here in front of the pulpit and you just use that, yeah, to light the chalice. And we're gonna put the words that we all can say together because not all of us have these memorized up on the screen. Say with me, 
We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. And now we're gonna do it with hand motions. Everybody ready? We light this chalice to celebrate Unitarian Universalism. This is the church of open minds. This is the church of helping hands. This is the church of loving hearts. Thank you, David. So we're coming up on an era time in this church year that always brings me to moments of anniversary in my own memories. Uh, 25 years ago this June, I was ordained, but 30 years ago this June, I made the decision to travel to that year's annual general assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And it was in Calgary, Alberta that year. I took the train to Whitefish, Montana. I rented a car to drive through Glacier Park across the gorgeous Continental Divide on the Going to the Sun Highway. Any of you ever been on that? It is absolutely stunning. And then on into Canada and Calgary. A number of wonderful things happened on that journey. And then at that General Assembly, more wonderful things happened that all led to my decision to acknowledge that I had been receiving a call to ministry and to awaken to that call, to feel it and to respond to it. And one of the powerful things that happened at the General Assembly was hearing the Unitarian Universalist musician, Nick Page, perform a beautiful version of a hymn that I had never heard before. The experience was so moving that I decided I wanted to learn more about what was behind it. And there's a story that adds meaning to this song. In 1933, a science fiction writer, a woman named C.L. Moore, I guess back then she had to use her initials so that people would take her seriously. Somebody out here is a fan of C.L. Moore. I saw that hand go up. In 1933, she wrote a short story called Chamblo. And this story inspired Robert Heinlein, any Robert Heinlein fans out there, to write, he's more renowned, I think, to write and publish a 1947 short story that he called The Green Hills of Earth. And this story then inspired 
the musician Paul Winter. Any Paul Winter fans out there? Paul Winter was a pioneer of sort of world music, which means someone else's local music, right? And he also wrote what some people might call space music or contemplative spaciousness music. And Paul Winter started working in the late 60s and became more and more popular through the 70s. And he ended up getting a, an award, the Courage of Consciousness Award for creating music that celebrates the sacredness of life. Um, he formed the Paul Winter Consort, which was a collection of musicians. And they soon became artists in residence at New York's Cathedral of St. John the Divine. In 1982, they connect to my story that goes back to C.L. Moore and Robert Heinlein because they created a whole mass that became an album called Misa Gaia. Misa Gaia means Mother Earth or the Earth Mass. And Paul Winter assembled so many musicians and composers to help him with this beautiful work. If you have never listened to it, it's really worth a listen. But one of the people he asked was Kim Oler, a composer, to create a song that was based on the C.L. Moore, Robert Heinlein story. He particularly, Paul Winter, particularly wanted that story in his Earth Mass. It's a story of an aging spaceship engineer and poet who has been wandering through the galaxies for most of his life and he'd been blinded by radiation poisoning and was crisscrossing the solar system, writing songs along the way because he was a poet, he wrote songs. And the story says near the end of his life, he decided to hitch a ride on a shuttle that was going back to earth because he decided he wanted to die and be buried where he was born on his mother earth he entered in an irradiated area so he could save the ship from destruction. There's quite a bit of drama, but then he asks the crew, because he's in isolation, to record his final song. And then after they do that, he died just moments after reciting his final verse. So older, you know, jumping forward to 1982, wrote a song for the uh, Paul Winter's Earth Mass, and he imagined what that song must have sounded like for that aged space warrior to have, have sung as he returned to Earth. And in the Misa Gaia, it's called The Blue Green Hills of Earth. And that song, jumping forward to the 90s, was nominated by somebody, I don't know if I know who, had chosen to be included in what was then the UUA's brand new hymnal that they were creating. You have copies of it near you. It's the gray book. That used to be the new hymn book. Anybody who are here who still calls it the new hymn book, I know how old you are. <laughs> and it was not published until 1993. The hymn book is called The Singing the Living Tradition. And anyway, that song, the older song, got put in our hymn book with an arrangement by Nick Page, which brings me up to my story beginning in 1992. I heard Nick perform it on the symphony stage at the 1992 General Assembly for the Earth Forever Turning is what it's called in our hymn book. And that was the year, that was the moment maybe when I said, darn it, I'm enrolling in seminary. And I did say darn it, because I wasn't a big fan of that idea, but I did it. So I'm telling you this story on this Earth Sunday to remind myself and us of this truth, that inspiration and hope and beauty have always been in our universe. And realizing it, awakening to that, depends on not just each of us having our own aha moments, but many of us having these moments and taking the time to share our experiences, tell our stories, pass along the messages from generation to generation of what we have found that awakens our own call to life, that gives us hope, that calls us to be co-creators of this amazing 
universe. Somehow, a message from a woman in 1933 inspired a writer in 1947 who inspired a musician in 1982 to inspire the 1992 arrangement and performance, which went straight into this person's heart and led me to the ministry and to me telling you this story in 2022. The Buddhists call it transmission. Hearing this song meant so much to me. May on this Earth Sunday it awaken in each of you a deep sense of the gift of your life on this beautiful blue-green home we call Earth. That was gorgeous, and thank you for that story, Reverend Linda. Um, I'm a big fan of Highland. I've read that, that story many, many times, and, and I'd love to know how it has found its way into the UU tradition. Let us take a moment now as we worship together to pause for a time of centering and sharing. Notice your breath as it moves in and out of your body. Awaken to the feelings, the thoughts, the memories, whatever it is that is arising for you. Let yourself be held by the rhythm of your own breath. Breathe in peace. Breathe out love. Breathing in peace. Breathing out love. Breathing in love. Breathing out peace. Each week when we gather in community together, we remind ourselves of what matters most to each of us as we mourn our sorrows and celebrate in our joys. We are encouraged by sharing with one another all that is in our hearts. We are part of an interdependent web. We are a community that cares for one another and part of how we embody this care is by making time to share what is in our hearts, the experiences which bring us joy and sorrow. I will now share what was submitted before worship this morning. Marty expresses joy that she and her daughter Katie visited UCville for the first time last Sunday. Their sorrow is that Mark, a high school friend, has a newly diagnosed brain tumor. We will be thinking of you, Marty. 
We lift up continued sorrow for the war in Ukraine, as well as other wars being waged around the globe. For all those people whose lives have been lost, and those who are now refugees seeking safe shelter. We pray for peace in the world, in Ukraine and other countries and communities, wherever there is suffering. May fighting cease and love prevail. Amen. This community offers its love and support to what is closest to our hearts. Another way we show our care for one another is in sharing our financial gifts with our congregation. Generosity is part of a spiritual practice and we take time each week in worship to name the importance of supporting the spiritual community and its work. Through your pledges and with the weekly Sunday morning offering, together we build the future of our congregation and our larger community. This is our shared ministry. From you we receive, and to you we give. During the music which follows, whether you are on Zoom or in the sanctuary now, you may choose to make your Sunday morning offering by using the text address or going to our website. And during this musical prayer of thanksgiving, you are invited to share not only financial gifts, but you're also invited to share the joys and sorrows in your hearts. Those on Zoom may put them in the chat box, and those of you at Rugby Road may come forward to place a stone in the water, symbolizing what is in your heart, and leave us a note on the joy and sorrow paper provided here. I ask Reverend Linda to light a candle now for all the joys and sorrows in our hearts this morning. Let us hold one another in a compassionate embrace. And let us dedicate all of the many gifts we share with one another by saying together, we accept your gifts with gratitude. May we use them wisely for the highest good. So this is Earth Sunday, and for many of us, it's gotten to be a more and more difficult observance from year to year as we get closer and closer to climate crisis. And one of the reasons I am so grateful to hear from our speakers this morning is because they are committed to offering each of us a chance to keep hope alive while we face the realities of what's happening on our planet. And I'd like to now invite to our pulpit, beginning with Sharon Biacco. Morning. Morning. What a glorious day. It really is wonderful to be here. I'm Sharon Biacco, and I'm gonna talk about active hope. Last fall, Reverend Leah invited me to offer a faith development course focused on environment because I had led our congregation's Green Sanctuary Movement. In 2012, 10 years ago, we had sponsored an all-day workshop based on Dr. Joanna Macy and Chris Johnstone's book, Active Hope. Here it is. 10 years ago, 10 years ago, we climate activists were already beginning to succumb to environmental despair. Dr. Macy, an eco-philosopher who has spoken at many UU congregations and who served as a research scholar and faculty at Star King School for the Ministry, gave us the inspiration to not only address the physical causes and aspects of climate change, but the spiritual ones. After a lifetime of activism all over the world, Joanna Macy, at age 93, continues to be an inspiration publishing her 12th book, A Wild Love for the World and the Work of Our Time, 
two years ago at age 91. She gave me a little push to get back and actively engaged again. And I said, what can I do at age 78 still? I can be a green granny. We won a spirit award yesterday. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, uh, and I can also be a teacher. I was a teacher all of my life. To my surprise, that month long book discussion of Active Hope last fall, based on Macy's work, which derives in part from a Buddhist perspective, drew a sizable audience. It's a surprise. Some members asked me to continue. And so this spring, we launched an ongoing group by the same name, Active Hope, or AHA, A-H-A, as co-leader Jean Umaker Sibiak, who's right here, calls it. Our mission is to encourage discussion and intentionality about choosing hope amidst the multiple crises we all face. Climate change, war, the epidemic, assaults on our democracy. There are too many. We held our first, first in-person gathering this month on our labyrinth, and we invite you to join us at our next meeting. It's the, first, the second Mondays of the month uh, on May 9th from 4 to 5.30 in the afternoon. We're doing them outside right now. We did do them on Zoom. Ours is a true faith development group. Yet I have asked myself, faith in what? since I am an agnostic humanist. I haven't heard those words up here very often, but that's what I am. My answers are science, our natural systems, Gaia, if you will, our work together, that's all of us, you, me. And yes, that does require me to take a leap of faith and intentionally, intentionally choose hope. Whenever the news fills me again with dread and sorrow, I return to Maisie's work that reconnects. Sean, please show the slide now. Thank you. Here is an image that depicts her notion of the activist's inner journey through the four stages of a spiral that we must navigate again and again as we face the multiple crises she calls the great unraveling. We're in it. And learn how to contribute to the simultaneously life-sustaining ways she calls the great turning. Macy writes, the spiral begins with gratitude because that quiets the frantic mind and reconnects us with our empathy, and personal power. Then we must honor our pain, our sorrow at the sixth extinction that is happening today, and dare to experience it and to move beyond fear. You can take the slide down for a moment. Thank you. This week, I watched a PBS special, The Power of Big Oil. As I watched, my jaw and stomach clenched, and I was overcome with an outrage for which there is no adequate word. Perhaps livid fits it best. I have known what they reported for many years, as I suspect have you. But it felt like I could see into the heart of darkness. And I too responded, the horror. I thought, is this greed what lurks in the heart of humankind? And then a tsunami of sorrow flooded over me as I sobbed, but no tears came. Later, when I shared this with some friends, they recoiled. My emotion was too raw. This is a common reaction to someone in severe pain. 
but it results in our being isolated and paralyzed when we need to be active and resolute. I'm thinking that many of you in our congregation may share that same horror when seeing images of the war in Ukraine, the attack on our capital, huddled refugees, people fleeing wildfires, tornadoes, and floods, or starving polar bears. Have you ever felt the same pain for the world? Have you? I thought so. We in Active Hope have learned that it is our wild love for the world that is behind our heartbreak. Our wild love for the world. You just saw it in all its glory. We you use sing to the spirit of life. The thought of its extinction and of the climate change catastrophe that has been foretold assaults our faith. Moving beyond the pain, or in order to move beyond the pain, Macy asks us to look at time differently, not from the perspective of our short lifetimes, but from a perspective she calls deep time. She writes, by opening up our experience of time and by revitalizing relationship with other species, other eras, we can allow life to continue on Earth. We can allow life to continue on Earth. She asks us to work to save the Earth, not for ourselves, but for those the indigenous people call the seventh generation, those living in 2222, 200 years from now. Macy writes, because I think about the future beings so much. There are times when I imagine I hear them. They are right behind my left shoulder and they are telling me, don't give up. They remind me that what matters is that I am alive now and they are not. And I can speak for them. Please put the slide up again, Sean. Understanding that we are all truly connected interdependent with all life and even the stars is a stage she calls seeing with new eyes. The Buddhists, of course, something similar, enlightenment. Now we discover the immensity of our heart mind and we become truly able to see ourselves in others, even in the future beings. Finally, Macy tells us that our recovered vision requires that we go forth. Go forth to create a new culture of interconnection. With our new understanding, we can begin acting upon our renewed faith, active hope. And the truth is, we are not alone all over the world people are working towards ecological sustainability and social justice. According to environmentalist Paul Hawken, author of the best-selling drawdown, which I have down there, and I'll show you if you want to later, gives all the solutions that are possible, are possible. From billion dollar nonprofits to single person causes, these organizations collectively comprise the largest movement on earth. This is a movement that has no name, leader, or location, but it is in every city, town, and culture. It is organizing from the bottom up and is emerging as an extraordinary and creative expression of people's needs worldwide. There is evidence that our systems are being recreated around us and that we do have the capacity, even at this late date, to make life sustainable on this planet. Happy Earth Day 2022. May we find active hope together. Thank you. And next, Jean 
Amaker Sibiak, my co-leader. Thank you, Sharon, although uh, it's, you're a hard act to follow, as we all know. Um, my name is Jean Amaker Sibiak, and um, it's just been an honor to work with Sharon and the others in the group. Um, whenever I've been faced with a crisis in my adult life, memories of the fall of way back 1951 have helped me find hope and the will to find a path forward. I spent the summer of that year, aged five, in the St. Albans Naval Hospital, where I nearly died from a kidney ailment, experienced my first long separation from my family, saw children die and their parents grieve, and watch movies with thousands of young sailors wounded in the Korean War. Unable to enter kindergarten that fall, after recuperating, I spent many magical days in solitary exploration of my Long Island neighborhood, feeling one with the trees, flowers, birds, rabbits, cats, dogs, worms, ants, and other creatures in our yards and vegetable gardens. In the afternoons, neighborhood friends home from school joined me for lots of vigorous, unsupervised play. Our mothers would call us to the nightly family dinner, before which gratitude was expressed for our food and for the care taken to prepare it. At bedtime, my mother sat by my side. I still tear up when I know. As I recited, and some of you older people will remember this. Um, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then followed, God bless mommy and daddy. And then a long list of grandparents, aunts and uncles, pets, friends in the neighborhood, everyone that I was grateful for having in my life. Those early experiences fortified me for our current troubled times because through them, I learned that no matter how bleak the future seems or what my spiritual beliefs are, it's possible to find hope and the courage to take positive action as long as I have a few foundational psycho-emotional supports in my life. The first is a family or small community of people who know and love one another, who compassionately share our hopes and fears, and who provide support for each other's actions aimed at dealing with perceived threats. Climate psychologist Rene Lertzman notes that the single most important thing such a group can do is listen deeply to the profound ambivalence we all have, even those who might be seen as woke about the environment, we all have to, about the dramatic life changes that we are being called to make. The second necessity is a regular practice of mindfulness where I feel and express gratitude for the miracle of my life and for my interbeing with the earth and the universe. Climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe has remarked, referencing Joanna Macy and Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, that hope is a practice one does best in community rather than alone. The third requirement is an understanding that life is very fragile and that I belong not only to a long line of ancestors who found the fortitude to face wars, famine, pandemics and natural disasters so that I could someday enjoy life. But I also belong to those generations that will come after me and who depend on my courage and action now to be able to exist and thrive. Today we face converging crises and the unraveling of our ecological and social systems and must relearn what was so easily intuited by a young child so many years ago from her small daily practices of mindfulness, gratitude, and interbeing amid family and communal community support 
and compassion. We can't have hope without action. We can't have action without hope. And we must consciously create the type of deep support without which we can have neither hope nor action. And we must, um, faith communities such as ours are a good place to build this future together. It is my sincere hope that our new Active Hope group will become at least a small part of the nurturing environment we all so desperately need. Thank you. And we've nominated one of the newest members of the Active Hope group, and any of you who want to join it can, Angela Orbach, to come forward and share your thoughts. Welcome, Angela. Hello, I am Angela Orbaugh, and I have been hugging trees since 73. Now, although my career took on a technology route, my heart has always been with the environment. I have a deep love and connection with all things nature. So I continued my studies and I also began teaching introduction to sustainability to adult learners in a continuing education college class. Now in the first class of each semester, I let students know that we will be covering some difficult topics, global warming, billion dollar disasters, and mass extinctions to name a few. But I also let them know that at the end of every class, we will have a list of actions that we can take to help make improvements in our own behaviors to impact the environment in a positive way. And I call this sustainability starts at home. However, last summer, about halfway through the course, a student spoke up at the beginning of class to express his feelings about the topics. He pointed out that although I had introduced the material with compassion and sensitivity, he just couldn't help these feelings of pessimism and despair that were building in him. And after he opened up, other students in the class opened up as well. And I also deal with these feelings as I work in many different areas to create a healthier planet. So we use that opportunity to discuss as a class the psychological and emotional impact of climate change and how emotional resilience should be an element of sustainability itself. We talked about how feelings of Hopelessness are expected. We talked about ways to address those feelings. We discussed how emotional fatigue and loneliness and pessimism and despair are all challenges for sustainability professionals as well. Those who work every day to make a positive difference in our world. The students even suggested the need for a sustainability counseling field to help people cope with these feelings that arise. Now, little did I know that the book Active Hope by jo Joanna Macy addresses this very topic. Six months after that discussion in my class, I saw an announcement for the new UU group on Active Hope. And it focuses on finding hope in the midst of the various crises that we're facing today. So I spent time reading Joanna Macy's book on active hope, and it is exactly what I was looking for. It is exactly what my students were looking for. It addresses topics such as gratitude, grief, interconnection and maintaining our own health and strength to continue making the world a better place as we forge ahead in this time period known as the great turning. Now passive hope is waiting for others to bring about what we desire. Active hope is about becoming active participants and bringing about what we hope for. But Active hope is a practice and we must continue to build it. And that is where the UU Active Hope Faith Development Group comes in. The UU Active Hope community has enabled me to create wonderful connections, show gratitude, build positivity and foster joy and peace. Active hope is nourishing my soul and helping me to develop a spiritual path 
for resilient, soul-fulfilling social action. As Joanna Macy taught us, active hope is something you choose. And I hope that you will choose to join us in spreading hope. Thank you all and let us close our worship with a beautiful, beautiful hymn. Go below me, I feel no motion standing on these mountains and plains far away. From the rolling motion, still my dry land heart can say, I've been sailing all my life now, never harbor or port have I known. The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue. sail and move my rudder as I ply the starry sea leaning over the edge in wonder casting questions into the deep drifting here with my ship's companions all we kindred pilgrim souls Making our way by the lights of the heavens In our beautiful blue boat home To the waves upholding me Hail the great winds urging me on Greet the infinite sea before me Sing the sky my sailor song I was born upon the fathoms Never harbor or port have I known Wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat home. The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue. may be seated for a moment of benediction, which means blessing. I give thanks for the kindred souls that are traveling along here with us. And thanks to Greg for his worship weaving and to Scott for his beautiful music. For each of you for being here today and to our wonderful Active Hope speakers. I give thanks for all of it. And on this Earth Day, I hope, I hope you have a little hope. We have a wonderful reception with some food because we had a beautiful service yesterday for Bob Gross, followed by 
abundant re uh, food and drink for the reception. So we're gonna share some of that with you today. So I hope people can linger, people on Zoom. I hope you can linger and talk with one another for a bit. Now we end this worship listening to Scott's beautiful music and remembering to take the light of this chalice and share it with all you meet. Go in peace. <laughs>